it sounds not as bad as it um, has been. So maybe this will be enough for us to at least sort of work with. Just checking here. Well, eighty-five percent, but it's coming. Um, there you are. I am just taking two each. Okay. Familia, esta semana, mi producto favorito, se aprecia... Sorry. Uh, are you, are you taking Twitch right now? Uh, you, uh, I am, I have Twitch loaded up, yes. Okay. Okay, are we audible? Yes, please. Yeah, it sounds like you are, but I am still significantly louder. So, yes, please. Yes, I even hear myself because I was in double listening for a second. And yeah, I see what you mean. I am very low, and I don't know why. All the, all the sets are top volume here. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And my microphone is right next to my mouth, so it's not that silly thing. I don't get it. Um, literally. Um, why don't we just turn my gain in OBS way down so we're about even, and then we can adjust from there? Um, I, I'm not sure if I follow you. Can you repeat, please? Uh, basically, in, since we can't make you louder, uh, just make me quieter. Uh, I don't know if it's fair, but okay. Um, okay. So, that's where she you are, and you should be this one. Um, can you hear yourself any lower in, in Twitch? Let, let's test. Okay. Um, chat, if anyone is listening, let us know how this is. Okay. So that's definitely chat. better. If anyone's listening, let us know how this is. A little bit more balance, right? Okay. So that's definitely chat. better. If listening, yes, that, that sounds significantly more balanced. Um, anyway, uh, if your voice is more clear uh, than mine. Oh, sorry. I am hearing myself three times. Yeah, that's because I was making a little test with uh, another browser for Twitch. That's, that's predictable, don't worry. Um, uh, can you hear yourself anymore? Uh, yes, I can still hear myself, I think. Really? That's new. Ooh, ooh, what an evening to be alive. Okay. What's going on here? No, but it doesn't make any sense. I didn't open any other channel. So, can you still hear yourself in Twitch? Uh, I think everyone... Ooh, but... KJ is saying both of us are broken up and quiet. Uh, but I am not hearing that for myself. Uh, I am sounding, you're sounding uh, still choppy audio, and I am sounding okay. Okay, so clearly there is something with my microphone. Microphones. Okay, I'll have to figure this out. So, um, what about this? I know it's not ideal, but um, what about this possibility that um, even though my voice is lower, since we have lowered yours down very unfairly, if you ask me, um, you can be the more hearable voice because actually you know much more than me and I am just trying to support as much as I can. Maybe speaking loudly, more loudly because right now I cannot figure out any other option. I know it's tacky, but it's the only thing I can come up with right now. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's not precisely the ideal conditions I have pictured, but uh, I think that right now I cannot get any better. I'm so sorry. And I mean, feel free to, to monopolize the conversation. Actually, I enjoy listening to you a lot, so we can go for that. Oh, well, thank you. Of course. I thought. 
I will stop the streaming and just restart before the starting soon. Well, not the, with the with the well with the intro directly. I don't have to stop the streaming. I will run the intro. The intro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another season of Sasa's Archeo Gaming Live. This summer, we're featuring Sasa gamer Julie Levy with special guests each week. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another season of Sasa's Archeo Gaming Live. This summer, we're featuring Sasa gamer Julie Levy with special guests each week. They will be playing through the two Legend of Zelda games, Breath of the Wild and the newest game, mm. Tears of the Kingdom. What is SASA? SASA stands for Safe Ancient Studies Alliance. It is their mission to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world by engaging the public and bringing together students and scholars to share their passion for the study of the ancient world in order to inspire a vast new generation of students. We do this in many ways, like these live streams, other live streams like book clubs and master classes. We have private reading groups going on over the summer, so RSVP at our events page. We also do research on the downward trend, have a virtual conference in July, have an open access database that is searchable, and much more. Where to find SASA? You can search Save Ancient Studies Alliance. We mainly post on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We stream on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, and we have a TikTok account. Archeo Gaming streams are only streamed on Twitch, but will be saved on YouTube later. Some protocol for the event, please be kind and respectful. Listen and ask thoughtful questions throughout the event. Please be patient with technology and those administering it. We try very hard to be organized, but inevitably there are some blips. Um, these, again, live events are streamed on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and will be saved on those platforms. Archeo Gaming is only streamed on Twitch. And of course, there are spoiler alerts for these games. Uh, you can subscribe on Twitch. You can enjoy SASA's live events such as Argo Gaming book clubs, reading groups. Please consider to support SASA with a recurring monthly donation. For as little as $3 a month, you can help us save ancient studies. You can also subscribe on Twitch for free through your Amazon account. And with that, thank you for joining us and have fun. So, hello, everyone. Are we audible? Can you confirm chat if um can you all hear us? Um okay. That's a good point, Constantine. Although eh, I don't rule it out today, it's a great day for technicalities. So hoping that you can hear me well. Welcome back to a second streaming of sentiment, a game which doesn't need an introduction like our guest today. Adam doesn't need an introduction. He was here last Friday. Welcome back, Adam. And um, as most of you probably remember, last Friday was a very bad day to be a member of Mobility in uh, late Middle Age in our Abbey. And actually today we are continuing exactly from where we left it. So, can you all see the game loading? Yep, uh, there, there we are. There we go. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Chat, chat says it's a guy who who tries to meet you. Mm. Can you please hear poor Adam today? He's being so patient with us. Okay, chat, can you confirm if you can hear Adam? Love the dinosaur. I'm just raising your volume just in case it makes a trick. Um, can you please, people in chat, tell us if you can hear Adam better? I mean, his voice is much more worse than mine, so. We're going to try this again, maybe. Okay, uh, we've now we've now maybe overcorrected very slightly from what I can hear. Okay, uh, okay. thank you, Alex. Okay, that 
Let's assume that that's close enough, and uh, chat, let us know if we need adjustment either direction, either if I'm way too loud or if I go back to being suddenly and arbitrarily too quiet. So, from the top, uh, if this is your first time seeing this, welcome to Pentiment. This was developed by Obsidian Entertainment and released just over a year ago, and it, uh, it rules. There's not, there's no other way to say it. Uh, we are in 1518 in, uh, sort of southern Bavaria, in this little teeny tiny fictional mountain town, and we are uh, a secular scribe and or a secular artist, Andreas Muller, working uh, in a medieval monastery that's a little bit out of time. And, uh, you know, the monastery's noble patron, Lawrence Rothvogel, just got horribly murdered. And uh, yeah, it was after one of the most uncomfortable dinners ever in the story of video games. And so, um, for all of those who love a really good Sherlock Holmes story, um, our next task, as I understand it, is to start finding out what has happened. Right, Adam? Yep. Uh, actually, we need to go hang out with uh, our friend Klaus Drucker, uh, the town printer, because uh, we got kicked out of the abbey on the grounds of there was a murder in the Abbey. Yes, so we need to go have lunch with him first, and then uh, after that, we are going to get a chance to go investigate the body and figure out, uh, you know, what are the horrifying injuries that got him killed? Yeah, I think this calls for uh, for some really important special visit. I mean, someone was dead. Let's start talking about it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you Conveniently, we have a horrible time limit, because uh, it's uh, three days until the uh, Prince Bishop of Freising's representative is going to arrive from Innsbruck, and we've got to have a culprit by then. Unless for uh, a poor innocent man, or very old man already in um, luck, um, unfriendly luck, I must say, uh, take all the culprits for this. So we have to prevent that. Exactly. <laughs> We don't want Piero to get caught, because he has severe arthritis and is also like 90 years old. So there's no there's no universe in which he did this murder. Yeah, that's also, it. we like him, because he's cute. Absolutely. He's one of the most adorable characters here, together with the cats, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 that thing you were commenting it on the, on the very detailed and the beautiful way that the letters and inscriptions are, are displayed here. And uh, I was curious to ask you, since obviously you know a lot more than me mm -hmm. about this game, because I have always noticed that when uh, there is a mention about the name of God or Christ in, in the sentences, it's the last word to show up. And I wonder if that's intentional somehow. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. So what we're seeing uh, is what's called rubrication, uh, so the marking of things in red. This is usually either like the first letter in a paragraph or significant words in a liturgical text, so, you know, um, God, or it's uh, various translations, so Dominus, um, Idonai, uh, Herr, if you're in the Luther Bible. So, whatever ling language variation you want for the sort of translation of the Hebrew Yahweh, uh, gets marked out in these sorts of early print books, and throughout the Middle Ages in manuscript, in red text. And you can't switch inks super easily when you're writing out a page. So you're right if you're a scribe working in the 15th century, you're not you don't have a black ink pot and a red ink pot and a blue ink pot. So you're going to do all the black ink on a thing first. You're going to blot it, you're going to let it dry. Then you're going to do the red ink and then you're going to do the blue ink. So anything that's rubricated there is being done later. Uh, and sometimes entirely by a different person. And, and they had a detail to, to transfer this to the very, the very dialogues here. Wow. That's yep. remarkable. Yep. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> Where, like, there is no other game that even tries to do that. And you can see the same thing, uh, a very similar thing in this sort of practice-based approach in the dialogue for the Drucker family here. They're the printers, their name actually means printer, um, and so they actually lay out the sorts, right, the little pieces of type, upside down and backwards, in order, it inks them, and then it stamps them onto the page. 
and same thing with those. Uh, you have to do it, you know, because you can't... When you have one of these big ink balls that you're stamping the swords with, you can't do it in different colors, right? It is Your option is whatever ink you stamp the ink ball into at the beginning. So you do the same thing. All the black stuff, uh, blank ink would be done first. Um, and then other colors, you lay out another set of swords to ink that in red and then stamp them. And then you do engravings. Um, if you're doing woodblock prints, you can do it at the same time. If you're doing copper plate engravings, you have to do another run of the page just to get the ink to transfer for the print because it's a different method of ink transfer. Making it double or triple more complicated than simply doing it by hand, unless it's a very, very well perfectioned technique, so to speak. Uh, I mean, uh, at this at this period, it's rapidly developing. Uh, so, uh, right, uh, a couple years before the events of the game, Albrecht Dürer does his master prints, which are probably the first uh, truly great copper engravings that you see in European print. And so he engraves those in uh, using a stencil, basically, into a big old sheet of copper. You run ink through that so it runs into the grooves, and then you force that at really, really high pressure along the paper, or take the paper on the copper plate, and you just squeeze them together really far while you run them through the press, and that'll transfer the ink from the grooves in the copper to the grooves in the other thing. Um, this might actually... No, this is woodblock uh, inspired. So the one we have on screen here is done differently, where it's a relief carving. So the high points on the carving become the dark points on the uh, transferred print. This can be done at the same time as other typeset because there, it's all the same relief sculpture. Do you, do you happen to know if this one in particular is inspired in a real one or? Uh, it's in the style, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, um, let's see, I can try and look it up while we run through the cutscene. Sure, I mean, it looks wonderful, I mean, here the choice is quite obvious, it looks wonderful. Yeah, uh, does it, does Klaus say what text that is, by any chance? Um, he doesn't really mention it, he's just telling you to uh, take a look at these new ones, so he's like quite elusive about the, the content for some reason. He gotcha. Only, he's only specifying that it's the, the drawings of him and the woodcut of his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like the detail that sometimes in his, his lines of dialogue, the ones of the printer, have this typical uh, worn out aspect when the types are too loose, so you can see the defect in the. Lens. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, it's so good. It looked like it's of the sort of style of various parables of the sower, uh, woodblock prints. Let me get a good cop rendition of one from the right period, uh, and then I can drop it in chat here. Excellent. Great. Yeah, here you have the Lord in red, as you said. Oh, such a beautiful detail. It's so good. Mm. Here we go. So if you can uh, chat, if you click on that, uh, that's going to be a uh, showcasing of the month of September uh, in sort of this late medieval, early modern imagerial thing. So, right, like Andreas is working on a Book of Hours calendar rendition of November. This is the same stock scene uh, before September done in a woodcut style that's very reminiscent of what we just saw in the game. Um, I just said, hey, I'm a meat because uh, as we saw last week, uh, we are making uh -huh. our character not exactly a very, very huge Christian, or at least not completely Catholic. Yeah. Also, Berthold is the best, and I love him dearly. Yes, it's a great character. You were mentioning last week, and it's a, such a sweet detail, the, the use of the food to show the different social aspects and the social classes in, of different characters in this game. It's amazing. Exactly. And, I mean, you can see it really, really clearly here, right? The Drucker family is not poor by any measure. Actually, right, we've got, we've got plenty of sausages, we've got nice bread, 
Um, looks like we've got some sort of porridge, the, and then we've got, uh, looks like pretty fresh butter. So also, and also the, the dishes are, look like they're wooden, but they're well-carved wooden. So like, they're not, well, they're not wealthy by any metric. They're certainly pretty well established. Uh, and so, I don't know, they're nowhere near as wealthy as like a print shop in Nuremberg, because we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, but certainly they're doing comfortably. Yeah. Yeah, actually, especially after comparing the, our previous meal with the with, with two people sitting down on the grass or with future meals we had. Yeah, it's like they are they are getting a lot of attention to this kind of detail. Even if it goes on nothing for the for the player, it really make gives an environment here. Absolutely. Um so here we have decisions, decisions. Um, shall we get explicit about talking about the, the crime scene, or shall we not? Uh, uh, up to you. Berthold <laughs> is sitting right there, and I'm sure would appreciate all of the gory details. I'm sure um, his parents would be less than thrilled at us. <laughs> okay, a lot of blood it is then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one can believe Piero did it. No. Poor soul. See? <laughs> Not even the child, yeah. Hmm. Look, we used to be kids. Like, I, I 100% know. Oh, tell me all the terrible details. <laughs> Contrary to all of my parents' wishes. Yeah, at some point when we grow up, we start not liking gore. And it's a cookie. <laughs> uh, I, why hmm. would he have cause to shout at Nobleman? Everyone has cause to kill. That's a Nobleman. great question. Yeah. Uh, this is what you me were mentioning farmer's bread, sausage, and egg pasta. Really surprising. Okay, yeah, that 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 makes sense. Uh, I don't know if they would eat that with anything. If they would just like put butter in the egg pasta and just roll with it, but uh, I mean, we are kind of almost in the Alps here, so it's maybe not so surprising that we're having pasta sort of uh, moving. And in this period, right, pasta is still fairly elite. Like, it's not a cheap food to make. Um, because it's an incredible amount of labor, right? It takes until about, I think it's the mid-1700s, where you're able to start sort of mass-producing pasta. Until then, you have to do a lot of labor with kneading the dough, pressing it out uh, into the shape, and then cutting it. And so it's like a, the fact that you're able to have it is actually a sign that you are wealthier than someone who just has bread. I have never thought even when was pasta kind of become popular, but that's so interesting and fascinating that they are taking yeah. this into account here. Wow. Yeah. Now, they put a ton of work into the food. Um, Josh Sawyer has spoken repeatedly and correctly about have, having uh, anti-potato propaganda spread out all throughout the Obsidian offices because there are no potatoes yet. <laughs> By 1543, I think you could arguably say that there may be starting to be potatoes. But in 1518, no potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, if I remember well, I think I read somewhere that for many decades were quite primitive of sailors and very specific use because of the, you know, the strategic use of nutrients, that they were not so white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which makes sense. Oh, Catherine of Otilia. I'm very curious to to go back to Otilia because I half remember it from the times I used to play this game, and and I remember it as a very interesting, complex character. Yes. Um... Or an old bitch, as Klaus said. <laughs> that's that's a way of saying it. But you know, des Lawrence deserves it. Uh, he deserves every bad thing coming to him. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of talent to be in a place not 24 hours and being a uh, possible target of uh, murder from, what, 20 people? So this guy is very good at murdering social relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, I don't know if it's me, but I, I think 
I noticed that the same way that you were mentioning that when a character is stressed, uh, there is more typos in their in their lines. And I also think that when a character is like uh, distracted or or concentrating on the conversation, the typos are corrected more slowly. It's something that sometimes I think that happens. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly how much uh, oomph goes in on the back end on like fiddling with the timing on it, or but it's regardless right the fact even the fact that they make typos uh though the drucker family if i remember right very rarely makes typos because they don't handwrite and you know correcting an error in print is basically impossible in this period right your option is rerun the entire page or do a manuscript gloss to correct your error but so for the most part, right, like, unlike when you're working in manuscript, where you can take a knife and you can scrape off the relevant ink and then just write it back in correctly. Printing doesn't have that luxury. Like, I suppose you could scrape off the ink, but then you can't just run one word. So like, if I remember right, the Drucker family very, very rarely makes typos because they have to set out all those sorts. One by one. Funny story here. Uh, my my grandfather uh, worked as an apprentice until he retired working in a newspaper in, mm -hmm. in the early 50s. And he was literally, uh, uh, I think the word composer, he was the man designing the different pages yeah. with the typos. Um, in his daily speech, he had the expression of remaking a page as the, as the worst them and course that he could say because for him it was the worst scenario ever. Yeah. Fairly so. So, will the prior kill someone over a simple disagreement? That's the question. Mm hmm. I think we go theological because, uh, you know, proto, proto Lutheran getting killed by a bunch of Catholics? What? No. Who could, who could predict this? Yeah. Yeah, that's an easy clue, though, game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, theology is saving us from a lot of you know, uncomfortable answers, I have seen. <laughs> yeah, I know if we had picked imperial law, there actually is a way to find some fun, happy loopholes for Attilia. Um, I... Everyone, everyone else despises our imperial law fun facts, but there actually is a way to find a loophole to let her inherit her farm. I can remember, I shouldn't speak from top of my head because that's useless, but um, I can remember that uh, if you choose medicine, it surprise, was surprisingly useful with Otilia, because I cannot remember mm -hmm. if it was influential, no spoiler, but um, I, I had never taken theology, I must confess. I, I love the occultism thing. Oh yeah, no, occultism, occultism is what I did on my stream playthrough as well, because it's just, it's very good. Yeah, so tempting. Bread. All right. And of course, Mother Cecilia had to be a keystone here because, well, if there is a brain in this hobby, it's her. Oh, 100%. <laughs> uh... It seems interesting that. But yeah, uh, so. I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. yes. No, please go ahead. I was just thinking that it's interesting that the reaction uh, of Andreas looking for someone to speak a little bit more calmly and rationally after such a trauma is uh, looking for the, for the printer family because it's like they are impersonating them. Okay, I don't want to say rationality, but it's like the, the ones who are a little bit less uh, moved by emotions. And it's quite interesting that they are linking that with the, with the press, with the printing activity. Yeah, uh, I know right, the game says a lot that, oh yeah, like they've... Right, Andreas has been here for what, like eight months at this point? and knows that he's on very good terms with the Drukers. But I think you are right, a lot of the reason why he's on good terms is that they represent sort of this connectedness to the rest of the world in a way that Tassin broadly doesn't have. Um, sort of, we, that gets complicated later, but right, this initial oppression is of this incredibly isolated, out-of-time rural community. And Andreas is from Nuremberg, right? One of the four great cities uh, of continental, sort of West Central Europe. Um, so it's like he's used to being at the center of everything. He's traveled all over the place. 
and right, the Druckers have friends in Basel, in Prague, uh, in Italy, and so they are far more connected to this world space than most everyone else in this town, uh, at least in Andreas' mind. And so I think you're right to say that, yeah, right, when he's in trouble, who's the first people he go to? The people that sort of match his worldview the closest. They are like the cosmopolitan kind of people in, in this town, if that's not a too big word for this town. But yeah, yeah, it's a good point. But yeah. Exactly, right? That does get complicated. We find out, uh, you know, that there's a lot of other people with a lot of other histories. Um, but at this moment, early on in the game, right, there's not a lot of that going on. And, um... and now we get our main suspects, right? We can... We think that there's really only four people who could have done it. We have Lucky, we have Farring, we have Attilia, and we have Mother Cecilia or whoever she's protecting. Um... We don't have enough days to take a look into everyone, so we can wander around as much as we want, but once we kind of pick someone to investigate, that's... time's gonna start passing, and so welcome to the main portion of, or the main sort of investigation mechanics of the game. And precisely the question that Andreas is asking, um, what leads to we follow next? I mean, wandering is great, and actually there's a couple of nice corners to wander here. But um, do you have any preference about where to start our little investigation? <laughs> Tisha, you know who did it? Dang it. Uh, hello, my friend. Uh, don't you dare tell us who did it, because I like the ambiguity. Uh, <laughs> Tisha was one of the... Uh, Martin is one of the uh, narrative designers for the game, so... Oh. oh, it was me all along. Damn it, you got me. <laughs> Damn. Yes, well... <laughs> Yeah, that would be a very interesting plot twist, so you are the bad guy all along. I like it. Of course. If there is not a magician or there is not a servant, it's the main star. That's the rule. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we should go run into the forest, though, because there is some nice, happy classical reception off in the forest, so... Yeah, yeah I, I didn't want to bring it up just the first, but thank you for giving me the excuse, so let's go to the forest. Exactly. Right? We should probably go talk to Brother Florian and examine the body, like, long-term as the actual first thing to do. But we should go into the forest first. There we go. Oh, also examine the statue in the meadow at some point, because we didn't do that last time. Oh, did we? Uh, and the statue in the meadow... Sure. Yeah. I mean, every time there's an inscription, there I go. So. Exactly. <laughs> and we've got a nice inscription there that we can only read half of. A shrine to Saint Moritz. The statue looks ancient. Let's let's read the read that description uh, that's being hidden. Um, I, I I swear to God that I have taken several screenshots and tried to identify it with some kind of a Roman inscription or such to identify mm -hmm. a pattern, but uh, uh, so far not so good. Yes, I guess it's some kind yeah. of so it it is actually uh just a very straightforward uh inscription. Mr. Legs, yep. Uh but right all it can make out is M A illegible and a T. So uh I'll give you a hint though. It sure sure isn't Moritz. Um that's that's a silly, but uh, well are, is it is it credible or is it logical that it's literally the, the name of Moritz just like that? It's not at it's not at all Mauritius, um, or any of the Roman and or German variations thereof. That sentence. The, the little optimistic epigraphist in me, in myself, uh, think that the third letter is a C, but uh, I can spend it two hours like that. So let's go to the forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's pry anything we can. Exactly. There's so many good people in the forest. Oh, yeah. And as you saw, a lot of rabbits and bugs. There we go. Oh, yeah. Small key. I mean, how logical is the Nick? It's, uh, it's perfect. <laughs> right? He, he lives in the smoke, therefore his name is Smokey. Easy peasy. Also, my literal favorite character in this entire game of very good characters. 
off in the corner there. Va Václav is perfect. Actually, if uh, you were commenting last Friday, I'm just taking a chance to recap a little bit, uh, but I really like this uh, this detail of the different uh, handwriting styles or not handwriting, depending on the character and then the perception of the character, like Smokey here handwriting his words. It's, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Smokey, whose name is also Adam. Coincidence? <laughs> Secret murderer. Black charcoal burner did it. So yeah, uh, if anyone doesn't know, this is actually his job is literally charcoal burner. Yeah. So he lives out here in the woods on the edge of society, and he takes dead brush and he puts them in one of these underground ovens that's like a constantly burning fire, and uh, turns it into charcoal, hauls it into town, sells it to everyone else's fuel. It is horrible, messy, filthy work uh, that pays extremely poorly, but is also a literally critical part of the rest of the industrial, but also artistic production for the rest of, like, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, I'm surprised to hear that it's poorly paid, because uh, I understood that this type of work, although not very glamorous, uh, they were quite strategic and post humanities and artistic activities, so, but yet they were not, like, uh, very rewarding. Oh, no, it pays pennies. It is... You, these people are eking out uh, basically as almost day laborers, where you pick up whatever work you can get, and selling these little scraps of charcoal for pittances. L literally, I think, I don't have the exact numbers, but if I remember right, something like four pennings for a full barrel of charcoal. And uh, so it's horribly paid work. Uh... And yet, right, uh, that sort of labor, right, uh, black ink, at the most simplistic, is produced from either soot or charcoal. So all the rest of the writing, uh, especially for sort of lower class writing outside of really, really fancy, like Gutenberg Bible quality inks, is largely produced through grinding up the work that these folks are producing. Wow, that's interesting. Well, yeah. At, at some point it gets complicated because, like, Gutenberg, the Gutenberg Bible uses uh, metal, metallic inks, which makes it incredibly fancy and complicated, but, uh, like, lamp black or soot black is just, it's charcoal or literally candle soot. Uh, that's been scraped, ground, and mixed with uh, usually egg whites or egg yolks. Egg yolks. Well, I mean, I, I only knew about the metallic ink or Gutenberg's Bible, but yeah, I confess I never thought about the different possible materials for the ink there, but yeah, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah, I, I did a project that's up on sort of my YouTube channel that's just looking at like the materials used by Albrecht Dürer mm -hmm. in one of his Apocalypse print series that's been hand colored. Uh, so by Albrecht Dürer goes in scare quotes there because Dürer probably didn't color this copy in. He just did the uh, actual printing for it. Uh, but right, he's used it's a lamp black and then. 500 other colors. Well, and uh, just uh, because here we have him, and it's, I think it's really remarkable in this game, kudos to the developers for not showing us only the stereotypical members of society. I mean, how many games do they play Roma in, in, as an interactive character? It's, it's really oh, remarkable. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly there's extremely few that do the early modern world mm -hmm. uh, in all of its diversity, as well as Pentiment does, right? We've got Václav, who's Roma. We've got Sebat, who's Ethiopian. We're going to have Jewish characters later. Uh, and so we've got tons and tons. We've got pagans, Protestants, Catholics, uh, all hanging out. Uh, and it's just... It's really, really cool to see, uh, and it matters a lot because, yeah, right, just like uh, with the charcoal burners, right, uh, the Roma often uh, or other wanderer 
pupils uh, live in this very liminal space where they're often stuck doing day labor. There's a lot of stereotypes against them. But they also manage to be incredibly well read. Do every theological option you can possibly do with Václav, by the way, because it's very funny. Okay, that's an advice before. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was too pedant for to reply uh, with theology into the second conversation, but A is Andrea, so let's go. Oh, you, v Vaclav, uh, the, the more you talk to him in Act 1, uh, spoilers for a long time ahead of gameplay, um, he comes back and it is the best. I... I don't even know how to sum up Václav. T-Shift, do, do you have a clue? How, how would you sum up what Václav is doing? Because uh, short of saying spoilers, go read Carlo Ginsburg, I've got nothing. Yeah, we are really demanding on that today. We really appreciate it. <laughs> I really like to see how in the game, in different characters, they are displaying that there is a role in curiosity to access to books. Not, even if you are not a, a monk or a, or a copist, or you are not supposed to access to them, there are people interested in reading beyond the, the supposed to be. That is, it's kind of Absolutely. Like, yeah, it's, it's like the underground message of there is a change in coming. It, it's super good, and it's a place where Curacao is remarkably uh conservative um right and it was said under father matthias uh right the previous abbot before gerno that they were much more open to having people come in and actually use the library that matches early modern um attitudes towards books much more clearly because in 1453 right um gutenberg publishes his first thing using the movable type printing press uh, by the time period of the game, 1518, right, there are uh, dozens of printing presses around Europe. Actually, I think we're over a hundred at this point. Uh, so, as a result, right, uh, the monastic access to these big libraries has almost overnight, um, sort of fallen apart. And while there was already a culture of like book collecting uh, in like the 13th, 14th century, it expands very, very, very rapidly. Also, yes, that's heresy. Let yeah. him, let him cook. Yeah, let no, this yeah. man cook. <laughs> we are, we are becoming too peevish for my taste. But yeah, let's go. Uh. Hmm. 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 Anyway. Uh, yeah. The, the result basically is right. There are runners, uh, usually based in Nuremberg. Uh, there's a pretty large community of these like s couriers who will travel around through a network of towns, including along the Imperial Road from Nuremberg to Innsbruck that Tassing is just off of. And uh, they would carry books with them, uh, often very Fairly cheaply printed, fairly small things, but also sometimes like Dürer prints. Uh, he had two couriers that worked for him uh, in around 1500 with the distribution of his Apocalypse prints. Ah, uh, uh, no, don't, don't tell him to repent for this nonsense. Yeah. No, wait, don't do... No! Much, <laughs> Let him <right>? cook! <laughs> um, so, it, it, it's ironic because um, last week we were trying to get a little bit heretic and here we are. You know, in this format. Oh, yes. Vaclav, Vaclav is doing a little bit of theology, uh, and he's comes up with some interesting ideas, and I think we should encourage that rather than being annoyed at it. So, let's say you might be onto something, or is that too daring? It, uh, I think I, any of the first three won't do a whole lot. Uh, I don't trust the fourth one. Um, okay, let's I'm I'm taking the the parliament here, and I'm let's say we are getting a little bit more heretic. So yeah, her heresy. Let's yeah. go. Heresy has killed uh, one, but oh, okay, wait, sorry, I said nothing. Put him in the charcoal pile. No, I love. How are we supposed to have glorious 
the harassing our moments if we put him in the charcoal pile while he's only a little bit of a heretic. Come on. Let him grow. Never hurt anybody. Yeah. Hey, if you are burning someone, at least let's give him a try. Exactly. Besides, he's not he's not even the worst heretic in this town. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that there is a lot of killing the, the stereotype of middle age, or well, not exactly middle age, but you know what I mean in this game, because a lot of the characters here are not the ones that you expect in, in very typical depictions in movies or other video games. It's like the oh, yeah. partner, for example. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no like night nights in this whole thing, even though this is a time period that still definitely very much has nights. Um, right, there are. There's a lands connect, but they're they're weird. They don't count. Uh, and well, that's a job for future me to talk about. <laughs> and he would have things. They have good fashion. They, it, the important thing is that they have good fashion. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that them. I really anyway, totally Saint Satya, right? Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Saying Satya, no other possible interpretation of this image, of course. What? No. Yeah, by no means. No, definitely. Def the, the, the bow and the deer are definitely not associated with one pagan figure in particular. Not at all. I mean, I don't think anyone in this cat has ever even made a connection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I When I was doing this, uh, I saw this and I, was, I wound up calling the twist like at the very end of the game, literally before I even clicked on that for on it at this point in the game, because I was just like, "Wait, I know this figure." <laughs> Turn, like... Turns out, if you know your history, it does just spoil the game for you. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, that and the fact that there is some epigraphic comment here is the reason I am trying to skip it in the sanctuary. I mean, it's very worth watching, but I'm saying no more. Although I must say that I yeah. really admire from the very first time I played this game the way that they have depicted the the, the aesthetics and normal or usual reuse of, of pagan figures or even pagan altars or inscriptions have in, in oh absolutely in and modern times. They, from my experience, they generally resemble something like this. You know, it's really very well yeah. Uh, this this this. I don't know if the exact aesthetics are attested, but right, the st the style is right. Right, this is like uh, effectively a pilgrimage shrine of a type that's attested all across uh, southern Germany, Czech Republic, and Austria. Uh, so that's great. I don't know a whole lot about you know Roman relief sculpture uh, ending up inside of them, but the raw it's at least evocative and communicates the sort of narrative and thematic goals of the game. Really, really nicely, and given how good they are at the rest of it, I'm guessing they do have a couple of specific references that they were working from. Yeah, makes all the sense, yeah. So, here we have Sky in the Waterfall, and... Yeah, we are... Are we interacting with anyone here, or is just later? I don't remember, actually. Not yet. It's, it's later that there are people out here. I think right now it's pretty much just, you know, hanging out, uh, getting the lay of the land. Figure out what we're used to seeing some good ducks. Of course, and our eternal rabbit friend, and a mine. And the owl, the owl on the salt mine is just the cutest bloody thing. <laughs> there it is. Look at him. He's so small. The little fellow. <laughs> like a little old ancient Athenian coin. Mhm. Mm there, there's like four different owls in this. Uh, game and they are all perfect. It it calls for a single book about the art of this game and there's a whole section just for animals because they are really elaborate and well done. I I adore them. Uh, I know they are for the most part working off of like 16th century uh woodblock prints. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can find one. Uh. Of a suitably, suitably early modern and distressed looking owl. I love the squirrel here. Oh yeah, the squirrels are also fabulous. Oh, I mean, well, those are not distressed, but those are pretty perfect. Uh, I'm gonna 
drop these ones in chat too, just because they... They might be my new favorite. Um... No more written needed. Do, 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 do. Look at look at them. Certified certified heroic owls. Oh, whoa, are those Doctor Owls? Uh, it's uh a it looks like it's a pilgrim and a knight. Mm -hmm. As as owls from the first half of the sixteenth century. Uh, soldier and pilgrim, yeah. So they are just. I think the, the, have... they're perfect. Oh, animals to pet. Sorry, game kind of stopped. Animals to pet. Yes. Uh, we've got we've got a pet stub. Yeah, I mean it's it's a law. There is Look how good stub is. And there is a well, there are millions, but there is a really beautiful detail in this game about animals when you pet them because it's obvious that the guys who have designed this know about animals because the way you pet cats is the real way that you pet a cat, and the way you pet dogs oh, absolutely. is the way you do with a dog. It's so realistic. It's 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 so good, uh, and it's a nice thing, right? When the rest of the game is so wildly stylized mm -hmm. that we get uh, often very very faithful renditions of what a lot of these sort of movements and animals uh, and it's good Absolutely. oh yeah right there's a new area added to the game that I haven't seen either I forgot that they kept that they've added a patch that adds like two that adds a bunch of stuff out in the farmlands so that's actually fully brand new to me oh never been seen the mill well, the mill the mill's part of the original game, but there's another road here that didn't used to exist uh, that goes out into the farmland, and that was patched in uh, a couple months ago, actually. Oh, okay. Shall we? Yeah. Shall we see the Roman ruins before, or I'm just trying to go to my to my familiar ground, or do you prefer to go to the to the uh, farmland? Let's start with the aqueduct, and then we can uh, head out on this other road out to. Uh, the new area. I really like details here. This is such a beautiful part of the, the design on the story. The drawings, the tiles drawings in the architect. Makes it so human. It's... It's very good. And we love, we love the artist because Paul is, Paul is perfect. As with everyone in this game, they are perfect. Yeah, it, it's really hard to hate most of these characters apart from the, well, from the corpse. But uh, yeah, in general, they are really easy to love. Well, there there is one other one who's incredibly good to hate. Yeah, apart from certain anonymous monk, <laughs> yeah, who yeah, it's not so difficult to hate. Yeah. And there... actually, I'm surprised we didn't meet him up here. Uh... Sorry. Right. I know. I know there is a scene with Lenhart up here, uh, but. I'm... I guess it's not active yet because we're not on the second day. Um, Actually, makes sense. Actually, um, mysterious. Okay. Yes, other farms. This is the one you were mentioning, right? Uh, yeah, the other farms. Yeah. I didn't know this was so fresh. Of course, chickens. Not killing chickens this time. And oh, it's Till's house. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I mean more, more time to work with Till. Uh, sounds great. It's uh, probably my favorite character in all the, the story here. Till, the the cool absolutely such a marvelous concept. Yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it was he was a character that right, I talked to him as much as I could in Act One, mm -hmm. and then he was just right. I was like, I want more of him, and then he was gone. That, that's a that's a typical memory I keep of this game about him. Yeah. Um. Maybe I'm just projecting from my utter love to the name of the roads, but shall we just try to see if it's already possible to to study the body? Uh, it should be time to go examine the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He lived in the ether previously. Yeah, yeah, he kind of did. But I mean, we knew there were other farms. Just um, you know, it was never relevant to go visit him. 
And so we didn't, and that made me sad. And now it's relevant to go visit him, and that makes me happy. Also, yeah, uh, I've not seen the uh, Act 2 uh, scene polish, right, uh, with Rudiger. I've seen screenshots of it, but I've not seen, I've not seen something coming up in the mid-game uh, on my own, just because I beat the game a couple of times before that was patched in, and then off we go. Uh, since it's patched in, I haven't gotten to that point in another playthrough. Turns out it's been a busy year in general for, like, history games, so I've not had as much time to just play more of this as I'd like. Yeah, if there's something I agree, is that it has been a busy year for history games. My god. So, let's, let's make a little WhatsApp to... Yeah. There we go. Knock, knock. Yeah. Shall we? There's no good story without a good autopsy, so... Yep. Oh boy. We have no medical training whatsoever. Um... Shall we brag that we have seen pictures, or is this poor monk going to take... Yeah, we... we... Florian won't mind. There we go. Florian, Florian's chill. Yeah, I am with Florian. Yeah. I can remember. Over that. a year since Batman's release feels weird to true. It has gone by so quickly. Time flies, and sometimes it's not good. And see you there, studying the face and head. Mm hmm. Let me check. Anything, anything. Nothing unusual. Alex was right. Sometimes we are not too patient. Wait for the correction of the title. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is a game that definitely, I think, rewards uh, just kind of slowing down much more than like games typically do where that's like dialogue 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 and this is a game that really you don't want to like super duper do for rush it actually i think that's the reason why at least i remember that i enjoyed much more the second time i, I played because you know the typical inertia instinct is to go 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 and this game is much more as to stop and look you know enjoy yeah, I, I didn't have that problem by virtue of the fact that I was streaming my first playthrough. So, uh, I was already in the slow down, learn everything, figure out everything I can do. Uh, which is great. Uh, turns out there's a lot to do here, but uh, there's a lot of stuff to pick up uh, when you slow down. Absolutely. We are not asking this again. Not in an autopsy. I don't have a <laughs> chair for that. <laughs> Poor man. Um, so I guess that the rational... It's such a good bit, though. <laughs> okay, do you want the running gag? I, I leave it entirely to you. Okay. It is a very funny bit, but it is also a very frustrating bit for everyone else. So... <laughs> Yeah, especially, you know, this poor man is, has invited us underground to, to do this, and we are just, you know, testing him. Come on. Okay. <laughs> right. He was holding his right hand from his side. Who died? Mercenary for 10 long years in Poland. That's how you lost your life. Yep. Own. Yep. Oh, he was just trying to make some cosplay of Ajax, poor man. <laughs> I really like the detail of how the body, the drawing of the body is getting more and more definition as they start making guesses. And, and yeah. Details it is really good. 
And it's really good in a way that, like, uh, I think in particular they're probably drawing on uh, Dürer and Da Vinci's sketchbooks uh, as probably, like, the two, like, easily accessible collections of sources that they're using for, the, like, what does human reference drawings look like in this period? Because if you look at, like, an anatomical print, it looks nothing like that. Uh, it's equally detailed, but it's not, like... It doesn't have the sort of vibrancy of the pencil strokes of, like, the sort of... I don't know how to really describe it, but the sort of animation uh, that they have in the, um, these, like, sketch drawings doesn't really get preserved into printed works pretty very well. And so, you know, they're, they're showing, you know, good use of, like, what are the different media the artist and professional artist will be working on. Actually, many times while playing this game, I couldn't help thinking that many um, expressive and dynamic tricks coming from comic books are, are poured into this game, though it's a video game, because many times it's the simple image mm -hmm. that is telling you much more than the words. Yeah. And, of course, as everyone expected and surprised to no one, Piero is very probably the, not the murder. Mm -hmm. so. But uh, Gerno is paranoid and also a terrible person. <laughs> and so here we are. Never trust the boss. Yes, no, it's going to take this is the French disease. Some Syphilis. Country, yeah. Some countries are not. Right, syphilis, syphilis is always a somebody else's disease. <laughs> yeah, it takes two to take it. Yeah. Right, but like uh the I think it's what Germans call it the French disease, the French call it the Spanish disease. Uh, I wanna say the Spanish call it like the Turkish disease or something. Right. Literally every language is like blames it on somebody else. Very telling of international relationships, actually. Mm-hmm. Or the Italian disease, yeah. Mm. Um yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's a fair commentary. I mean, he was a, a mercenary, but I, I like to see his reaction. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. This man didn't used to be a monk. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, there's the whole genres of literature about this. There's whole. I mean, the, the answer is yes for all of those Yeah. And, but, uh, yeah, like, it's it's a very common motive in uh, medieval vernacular literature mm -hmm. to make fun of monks for being uh, not particularly chaste, not, and nuns as well for being um, not... Yeah, very bad at being chaste, uh, and uh, really any visitor being a potential target of um, solicitation. I, I remember also, yeah, between Andreas and everyone, uh, true. Okay, of course. I remember that. Story. But yeah, uh, oh, sorry. The, the, there's a very, very famous uh, marginalia that is a nun picking phalluses off a tree that's likely a commentary on this exact phenomenon. Wow, there has to have been a metaphor. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the uh, metaphor with all the subtlety of a brick. Some, well, several years ago, I remember this, in an excavation, this, uh, this archaeological girl told me about uh, how one year she was excavating in the outskirts of this convent in, in very deep rural Spain, and they accidentally discovered a tunnel that was connecting underground with the convent, and they were explicitly required to cover and never comment it. Well, there you have a story. Yeah, I love this art. It's really, really good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's playing very well with the. Let's try to get anatomically, but not explicit, but yet artistic and a very well balanced uh, style for a game like this. Yeah, it's really, really, you know, delivery. <laughs> yeah, it, it works really well. Yeah, that, that's a stupid question for a mercenary, but I want to see his answer. Mm -hmm. mm, there you go.
God, Florian is so good. He's such a good character. Absolutely. And just such a chill guy. Yeah, it's like that steadiness of war veterans that are hardly ever moved. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we get into bad turtles with any medicine student? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah, I want to know. Absolutely. Right, that information is potentially very useful. Oh. Also, this is a nasty wound. Yep. I I appreciate the um leaving it to the imagination. So if you don't like the if you don't like him when he was alive. You are enjoying this moment. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Pro probably not attacked that far away from the chapter house either, though. I I'm curious because there is always this common place that, of course, um, autopsies and study of bodies was forbidden for centuries. But is there any literature on the real existence of these and okay not maybe obvious or religious environments or not necessarily in in this time hmm? uh could you, you broke up a little bit during that so could you repeat oh, sorry. it sorry yeah i mean i was wondering if there is any literature on the real existence of of autopsies and analysis of corpses and such apart from the famous da Vinci's oh. work in in this time gosh uh i know there is uh there's actually some uh, contemporary sources from like the back half of the 16th century that are like big medical treatises that are clearly taken from autopsies. But in terms of um, academic work, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can try and look it up here. Uh, because they're not right, they're technically not allowed, but they are definitely a little more common e even in the Middle Ages than. A official doctrine necessarily encouraged. Yeah. Uh, so, like, there's ones that are like, uh, just looking here, National Institute of Health, uh, going all the way back to like 1928, has records of, oh, yeah, 15th century autopsies that have been analyzed by academics. So, like, it, it definitely happens. Uh, it's just not right. Properly speaking, right, uh, the ban on autopsies is definitely more of a, like, high medieval thing than a late medieval one. Uh, the Black Death really does sort of mess things up, uh, so there ends up being a lot of interest in sort of morbidity and the aesthetics of morbidity uh, from, like, the 1350s onward. And as part of that, uh, there's a lot more people sort of having to deal with the realities of examining corpses, and a lot more people, like, interested in uh, examining corpses, whether that's through uh, properly associated, like legally allowed autopsies, uh, judicially ordered autopsies, or just grave robbing, right? Oh no, you need a corpse to examine? Well, there's a whole graveyard full of them. Uh, pray for forgiveness, not permission? It's surprising how that was a, a, a true social problem, even well into Victorian era. Mm-hmm. And for largely the same purposes, right? Uh, the hospitals always need more corpses to exam to teach students using, and so you get a cottage industry that lasts for hundreds of years. Of well, you need some extra cash. Go steal a corpse and then get the heck out of town, um, right? You get you steal the corpse, you sell it to the university. Uh, they pay you under the table, and then you get out of town before the church, um, whoever owned that graveyard comes knocking. Okay. 
I mean, I, I just want to think well, but I guess that it's not anymore a reality nowadays, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, and this is a place, right, where someone like Václav, uh, who is transient, right, since he's Romani, he's or typically, right, nomadic in a known circuit, um, but still, right, move from place to place. Uh, so, unfortunately, right, due to social ostracization, right, grave robbing, theft, uh, usually petty theft, and occasionally more extreme examples of uh, highway robbery, or unfortunately uh, endemic among early modern Romani populations, and certainly doesn't help the stereotypes. Uh, right? The stereotypes rapidly get worse and far more cruel than the reality, and are, you know, blaming the person for the systemic issue. But it is nevertheless true that, you know, in desperation uh, and la lack of ways to earn legitimate mercantile livings, that people would resort to these sort of darker spaces uh, of dubious legality uh, that would, of course, get enabled by fairly high-ranking institutions and people in the cities that then turned around and blamed the Romani for the endemic of crime. Yeah, and if there is anything not good for, for developing an uh, imagination in a stereotype, is messing around with dead bodies. So I guess that is just oh, yeah. to the fire, of course. Right, messing with dead bodies and robbing people, uh, or selling scams, or there's no shortage of scams for them to like pick up in one town and sell in the next town, because oh boy, is a lot of this medicine right. Florian is a very grounded, sober, serious medical person, um, surgeon, not a medical doctor, but uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of people with far fewer scruples. And also a lot of well-intentioned things that were just poison. You know. Lead's totally good for you if you mix it in stuff, right? Right, guys? Right, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean... Use arsenic as makeup. Nothing bad can possibly happen. It's one of the safest products in the... and they never finish the sentence. <laughs> Beautiful sentence. Hmm. Deconstructing a scrub note. Our first appearance. Uh, I have a friend uh, at the rare books library I used to work at uh, who found an early modern text mm -hmm. that has almost the exact same hand as this. Really? And it was frankly shocking. Wow. It was even purple ink. Very so, um, I don't, I don't know which of the developers, uh, is planning on committing murders IRL, but, uh, so, someone did time traveled and dropped basically the exact same hand wow. into a real book. Wow, that's so intriguing. Wow. Hey, is there something worth a small documentary? Is that? So, the girl, what's your, hmm? what did you find? So, I guess you are one of the nuns, just because of the logical connection? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, so this is apparently, right, referring to something, uh, and then says, at Madden's, right, Madden's at the chapel house. Right, we know what you did. Yeah. Well, Meet here. Point. Yeah. Um, Shall we go book or shall we go their friend? I don't think they're friend or Flemish. I like to... they're, they're both they're both really good options because I like both things are very true, right? There are no there is no um what are they called? Uh there's no inscribed lines because when you're writing, for the most part, you actually take uh your your stylus mm -hmm. without any ink on it, and you're gonna scratch rules. Uh, into your text block on your parchment in order to say, yeah, so this is the writing line. You know, uh, your capital M goes below the writing line. Mm -hmm. 
at the, the the sender on your K and capital house uh goes below the writing line. You've got ascenders above that, and it's like so you have these rules, uh and some sometimes I actually take a pin and go stick, 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 so there's holes in the parchment to help you make those guidelines straight. Actually, and this has none of that. And uh, it's quite interesting because actually, uh, yes, always going back home, but uh, if you can find the remains of these lines, even in inscriptions on stone, so if it's yeah. almost impossible to do it in a hard surface like that, writing, handwriting, it shall be literally impossible. Oh, yeah, it's like it's not impossible, but it is a sign of extremely high status in training. Yeah. Right, that, that is literally like, uh, Finer than fine, right? Um, I've seen like even things made for emperors that have these guidelines. So this is one done without that on commission is literally like imperial levels of wealth going into the commissioning to find the right scribe for this. One in a million, I guess, and someone knocks the door. Ooh. Here we have the uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Not Vena. Give me a moment. I have to hide and rest. Exactly. Um, I guess, of course, let's not mess around, right? Yeah. Florian, I mean, we like Florian. We're not gonna, we're not gonna yell at, yell at him. And so we're gonna be completely subtle. Uh huh. God, I love, I love how pretentious Werner dresses. Yeah. I mean, look at that coat. Strictly unnecessary. The way he walks, it sounds Well, maybe one problem, but get that. Mm -hmm. I love that when yeah, people yeah. are getting angry, they start dropping little ink spots all around it's, the world. It's so good. Uh, usually when that happens, uh, actually, right, in quill writing, uh, that's actually usually a sign of that they're getting sloppy and are starting to push the quill instead of pulling it. So basically, right, uh, if you've tried to write with a fountain pen, you kind of know this, uh, where the uh, quill pen has a flat part with a slit carved in it, and then it's all sliced at an angle. And so if you try and push that, it's going to jump on the page and splatter ink from the nib forward. Well, so a lot of the hands and brush strokes here are finding different ways to more effectively, like, pull. Oh, uh, using only pull strokes, uh, create letter forms that are legible. And so you can get away with it sometimes, but you'll see, you're right, like the letter E in a classic uh, Carolingian minuscule, your most legible hand that becomes Times New Roman, uh, actually has three brush strokes. Or three pen strokes, uh, because it is annoying. It is excessively difficult uh, to write it. And even in like this one that Florian has, um, I would guess the E is actually made out of two brush strokes, like in performing. So you'd start at the top, and you'd make one, and then you'd go back to the top to make the other one. <laughs> Instead of how most people write today, which is just like a squiggle. Yeah, uh, right now I'm just trying to picture how I would use a letter. Yeah, you're right. It's curious you never think about how you do things until you stop. Yeah. That was close. Exactly. Uh... I always wonder because, I mean, I, I, every time I have played this, uh, I have kept uh, hidden here. I always wonder if it's still a stupid idea to, to show up when Florian is speaking with the, with the physician or not. I don't know. I have a feeling it doesn't change a whole lot, except it makes the abbot even more pissed at you, which, frankly... At some point, it starts... Oh, no. Funny. Yeah. 
<laughs> that that is it's so hard to end up in the abbot's good graces um that I don't super care anyway one day 19 hours remain oh boy yeah time flies when you're looking for a murderer the ghost who died at the innocent with her mm-hmm do you, do you want to, to explore the line to, to go to you know where to explore the line of her, or do you have any other prefer? Uh, I'm cool with whatever, I think. Uh, right, for anyone who hasn't played this game, right, since we do have a time limit, uh, right, the more you commit to, like, following one line of inquiry, the more information you're going to get. Mm -hmm. For the most part, each thing has two to three stages, and you only have, I think, six time, five or six time blocks total to play with. So we can either look into everything a little bit, or a couple of things really deeply. Um, so, look into everything I'm cool with whatever you feel like doing. Yeah. I'm cool either way you want to do that, so. It's always my natural tendency when playing games to try everything a little bit, you know, messing around. Yeah, the only, the only exception I will say is that I will insist that we um, have a meal tomorrow lunchtime with Sebat. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because you we gotta. Yeah, actually, I'm very intrigued about him after what you mentioned. So yeah, that's a must. Though I don't know if it will be a meal today, tomorrow, if you know what I mean, or it will be in the next streaming. But yes, certainly. But yes, uh, right in in game time, uh, right we're at dinner time now. So tomorrow lunchtime, uh, has got to be with Sabbath. Um, I am trying to remember. Oh yes, it's next to the meal. Yes, the church and drugers. Okay, that way we can get back to the town. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, yes, here it is. Um, but when I'm with the tempering, if we don't tempering with the woman, yeah. Yes, that's Atelia. Yeah, exactly. I really have a serious problem with names, as probably you can notice. So, easy block. Uh, right now we're just looking for someone to eat with. We're not doing any investigations. Yeah. Um, so, just, but we can we eat can with get anyone. To the farm uh, through this route, right? Yes, that's my point. And we. Yeah, eventually you can get down to the Gartners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it then? I right, you can have. The other way around, right? Okay. Yeah, if you want to do that, that's super cool with me. It's just to see all the outskirts, because yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's surprising how uh, at the end of the day. It's how big is the all the setting of the town? It has um, more and more little sections and layers as you progress. Yeah, uh, and on the map it does indicate everyone you're able to have food with uh, in the menu. If you ever find yourself getting a bit overwhelmed, uh, right? It's got tada. Power Gardner, um, power middle, and okay, shall we? Try um, uh, with um, Bauer, or I'm just looking around. So I'm, I think any of them are good. It looks like the options are we can have Otto Zimmerman, either of the Bauer generations, uh, the Gartners, or uh, the Albans, the Bakers. Uh, yeah, this one, right? So, or Vatslav. We can have food with Vatslav and Smokey if we feel like to. Oh, it's true. So, what, do you want to go have dinner with him? I think any option is good. Uh, since we're over here by the Bowers, let's just have let's have dinner with the Bowers and see how they're doing. I mean, they have bees, good honey, at least guaranteed. Lead the way. Actually, it's, uh, in this kind of games, I always like to try to at least to to t to try as many characters as possible. It's just like. There is always this feeling like, hey, there's more people here to discover. Yeah. And there's whole families in every spot. Hmm. And food again. And more food. I really like how... Pretty good food, too. Yeah. It, it looks yummy, even in this time, yeah. I'd eat that. In 2023, I'd still eat that. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, yeah, let's let's try to make it the human version. Mm -hmm. 
I really like how launches and meals in general are like the, the information corner of the game where gossipings are rumors and things are spread. It's so so human, so real. Food and gossiping go hand Absolutely. in hand. Absolutely. Right, it's it's food. Um, it's right tasks, communal tasks like um spinning, uh, or um sort of thrashing weight, uh, sort of as gossip points. Uh, yeah, actually, those are kind of the main ones, right? The sort of uh, we'll see that. Um, I think it's in Act Two where we get a sequence where we can just like, I actually don't remember if it's Act One or Act Two, uh, where you can just go do, uh. Go listen in outside the door while oh. uh, there's a bunch of people doing the weave, uh, doing the spinning, I think and they'll just be chatting with you and spreading a whole lot of rumors. Yeah. All right, Hedy. Thank you. Was it everywhere? <laughs> Enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it? Shall we get golf? I mean, Hedy. Hedy looks pretty excited. Yeah. Down. Yeah, lean into it. Hmm. <laughs> Too sweet. Gossiping gets the best on the worst of us. Uh huh. I'm only curious. Yes, I need to protect myself. I mean, I wouldn't exactly call it broad daylight. Uh, <laughs> yes, but we don't run. Aww. I'm <laughs> sure I will have said that to my own mother in my time, but yeah. <laughs> it's 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 interesting because this game has layers all around because there is the, the the fictional one, there is the artistic one, there is the historical one, but at the end of the day, it's a murder mystery game as well. Uh, but it's yeah, like uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's something else. It's really good. Uh, I love how anime the whole family is. Uh, but right, right. It is just a very, very tightly written murder mystery. Uh, that, and I love it. I don't know how much detail should I go into onto sort of what the consequences of the murder mystery are. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Spoilers. Right, because that is that is that is spoilers. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right, uh, a lot of what makes this game work as a historical game. Right, it starts good, mm -hmm. but spoilers are kind of integral as to why it continues to get better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and yeah, right. Like as we get going, right, the idea that you know the murder mystery ends, but that's also not where the game ends. And so the idea that there is an after the fact really digs a lot into historical causality in a way that you really don't see role playing games do, right? Role playing games love this thing where you're able to do, I mean, the Elder Scrolls is the classic model here, right? Where you are basically able to go do everything and time will just wait for you to go do everything. And that's that's okay, right? That's important. It has a place. It lets people do as much or as little as they are interested in. But at the same time, as we think about, you know, historical causality uh, and sort of the knock-on effects, the, you can either have, you know, paradox-style Crusader Kings things where the clock's ticking and we're operating on the scale of generations, or you have something like this that really take that super duper focused approach um and explores it on a span of a few years and and uses that as a spot to sort of then echo out to a much larger time scale in a way that we really don't see also i appreciate that we're getting um a lot of anti uh peasant or peasant anti noble anti clerical sentiment right now absolutely this is important this is important this is really good and express in a very human way indoors at home in family because everyone is suffering the consequences yeah 
And mm -hmm. it's, it's not like a typical let's kill the heads and let's make a revolution. It's more like the feeling that generates with daily life experience. Yeah. I agree mm -hmm. with you. This micro scale and, of history is, is really is really remarkable. Sorry. And and it's really important because we're building up to a massively important political event. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1524, there is an enormous peasants' revolt across Fabia and Bavaria. Uh, and so, I mean, we'll get detail with that within the game bounds, but right, the fact that they're doing that groundwork here and saying, you know, that doesn't come out of the ether, this is a sentiment that's showing around um, quite clearly in 1518, and that there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of discussion, uh, right, both written and oral communication that's building towards this dam breaking. Uh, is really, really, really good. And, right, presented in a way that we actually get to enjoy, right? Um, like, this is not... Well, it's pretty um, easy to get into, oh yeah, here's a much deeper scholarly historical way of saying this. At the same time, this is done primarily through character drama and through familial drama at mealtimes. And therefore, um, it communicates it, like, I don't know, uh, it communicates it real in a way that you don't get to see in formats that are not games. Right. And that's pretty cool. It's, it, it's pretty interesting how they are um, making good use of, them, of the space that uh, getting into a whole historical process and not trying to, to cope with all of it, but just getting micro scale and all the possibilities that that context and environment gives you at a human scale to make a good story, plain and simply. Uh, yeah. It yeah. doesn't have to be like the great epic story, like civilizations or so on. Actually, it's... It's really nice. Uh, I remember the first time I played this game, I was constantly thinking about a, a book, a doomsday, uh, doomsday book. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard about it. It's, it's pure science fiction mm -hmm. about time traveling. To, to the pre-play time, and it has the same spirit of taking a very, very specific uh, place, time and family, in, in the middle of the big uh, twister of the, the pre-play moment in Europe, and how different is the perception of historical event when you don't try to get textbook or academic, as you say, but simply reducing it to the familiar scale. It's really remarkable that yeah. they have projected it in, such a, in a video game, which is not such an such an easy environment and such an easy format to transmit such a complexity in the plot and, and in the background. Yeah. It's... I mean, it all comes down to, like, execution. Uh, right? There, there's... It would be very easy to have this end up feeling very contrived. And I think it's a testament to the writing team here that it doesn't... It, it really feels white organic in a way that you there's no shortcuts to it you just had to write a lot and write the right words a lot and be sure it works yeah absolutely kudos to the writers of this game every day and just to conclude the dinner i am following one of the wisest rules ever never mess in a familiar trifle so goodbye bro <laughs> Oh, come on. Yes. Vatslav's only somewhat suspicious. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I kind of remember that it's very possible to ignore your sleeping time, but you have to pay the toll in this game, right? Um, there is... So, we'll have to do something during the daytime mm -hmm. in order to ignore your sleeping time. Ah, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Right, because we haven't done the crypt yet and so we're not able to ignore the fact that we've done the crypt yet um to go check out the check out the secret -y secrets yeah so nothing we can do tonight but tomorrow night we should have make sure we get that unlocked yeah i'm really late to that right now so i guess it's socrates time exactly Yeah, because we don't have access to the 
at the rest of the Abbey Yard until tomorrow anyway. So it's kind of whatever. I mean, there is always a temptation when you are in a resort to stay in another city to get laid to bed, but we are going to be good boys. <laughs> We're going to be good. And get woken in... Woken up in the middle of the night by the teeniest, tiniest Ursula. And the cutest girl ever. I love how uh, I almost pronounced your name. Sorry. Stare at this child. <laughs> no. Child. So disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can imagine I that. Isn't it interesting that by she saying nothing real can purposely understand what she's saying? Mm hmm Stop. <laughs> Shall we go for the cat and the cuddle? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh. Always do the regionally specific story. Uh, these ones I know. These ones I know change depending on your background or where you did your vandiyara, and so it's different folk stories from different regions of Europe in this period, and it's fantastic. Amazing. Thank you, Lisa. I don't want to lose the opportunity to mention that how much I love the very sophisticated point and tool that is used for the explanation. I really love it from the first yeah. place. It's great having having these little manacles that just point. It feels very, very authentic. Exactly. I guess I'm not the only one that every time that sees this scene, I see is imagining his voice like whispering as when you tell a tale to, to a child. Yeah. Floating in the water. <laughs> She's so awestruck. I. Yeah, her little face. She's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Well, go full. Yeah, attention span of the audience, always the same. <laughs> yep. My favorite. My beloved. There are no variations here, right? As I remember. No. I don't think so. Yes. Just the usual researcher thing. Messy desk and so on. Exactly. And also, three um, super dubiously heretical texts that Prior Fanring gave us. Well, we have seen that Andrea has a very questionable tendency towards religion. Let's leave it there. That's fair. Uh, I sympathize with Ferenc, but uh, Ferenc is giving us, giving us like the classic treatises of Solomon, uh, or classical treatises of occultism that were circulating in early modernity. So, uh, oh. shrug. Heresy. I'm sure that's fine. It's not heretical if it's purely for academic purposes. Oh, so that uses that all. Interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, no, there, there's a whole thing. Uh, this is the period in which the idea of a differentiation between white magic and black magic uh, starts really getting defined, mostly in Italy. And it's uh, the distinction... Right, so black magic has been recognized for a long time uh, due to a Latin corruption of the Greek word ne necromancia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right, the divination using corpses uh, was corrupted um, to uh, be black magic. 
And so early modern Italian scholars wanted to be able to do magic without, uh, you know, getting the church involved. Um, and so they, they invent this distinction that a hundred years earlier, right, clerics doing magic don't think of this, and they're just like, yeah, we're just doing magic, don't worry about it. Um, but these Italian scholars start saying, oh, we are doing it purely for academic purposes in order to better learn how to fight against demonic influences. We are on the side of the angels in this uh, war of the uh, incorporeal uh, ether, and so therefore it's totally fine, unlike what those peasants are doing. See, they're just summoning demons in order to go mess up their neighbors. We are doing it for academic learning purposes to better learn how to defeat them. This is white magic. What they're doing is black magic. Don't worry about it. If they could go on with it, kudos to them. Wow. It's, it's, uh, it's... I... Please go on. Yeah. What? No, please go ahead. Um, I did not have a thought there. I was making noises. <laughs> yes. Myself too. But um, yeah, I, I was just wondering that it's interesting how the, um, the notion of doing exactly the same thing, but for, let's say, scientific reason, you know, stressing the word, it, it, it's like a. Okay, how to put it in the post COVID era, but it has been prestigious up to some point so, since 500 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, certainly uh, occultism, right, is a very, right, it's a thing that's hard to explain um, or to communicate the sense of to a sort of um, contemporary audience. Because, well, you know, there's a lot of superstitions that still circulate in the present day, and a lot of folk traditions that have endured in some form or another. Um, ghost, ghost hunters, haunted houses. Uh, there, there's a sort of irony drenching that has happened, uh, right, where your belief has to be couched in this sort of skepticism, right? The truth is out there. We have to the belief is not genuine, it is just investigation for fun, for things. That's just not, like, that's a framework that makes it really hard to communicate how occultism works, because um, in, in the 16th century, right, people do wholeheartedly believe that demons exist, that angels exist, that all sorts of various folk monsters, um, you know, the Wild Hunt, uh, we'll put scare quotes around that, um, but, you know, that's some sort of Wild Hunt tradition, whether that's, you know, the Odensre, um, whether that's uh, Frau Perchte, whether that's Hern the Hunter, uh, that they actually exist, and that all these saints have very real intercessionary power, and so the feast celebrations of St. John and the bonfires of Midsummer and Valpurgisnacht uh, really matter and have this impact. And when you're in this world of very genuine belief, it makes it really hard, um, uh, or a fundamentally different way of understanding these occult texts. Because if the things that you are working with are real, well then the impacts that they have are real. Right? If you believe in demons, then yeah, of course there must be some logical, naturalistic, studyable way to, uh, like, control them, and to get them to do what you need to. That's just, that's not being crazy or superstitious, that's just correctly understanding the framework the world operates in. Ironically, a very pre-rational uh, setting or dynamic, even even though applied to, to superstition. But yeah, I see your point. Yeah, right. Um, so you know, when when Durer is carving, you know, angels pouring buckets of brimstone uh, over everyone, or has like the giant spirit of melancholia. Well, right, that personification is allegorical, but it's also in some way meant to be something that is psychologically real. Right. Um, in Scandinavian studies, which is my academic background, um, a scholar named Altman Jakobsen 
has this great book called The Troll Inside You, but basically argues for this, like, psychosocial reality. So, you know, we can look at the world and be like, you know, trolls don't exist. Mm -hmm. But to someone in a medieval mindset, right, well, uh, you can't necessarily point to any particular spot on a landscape and say, that there is a troll, right? Or any living thing and say, that there is a troll. But psychologically, if you think trolls exist, then that is going to start framing how you interpret the sensory inputs that you're getting. And so in a psychosocial reality and a psychosocial landscape, a troll becomes literal and existent and something you can point to a broken church wall and say, a troll tripped over that. And that becomes the explanation uh, that is real and literal and also has a perceptual layer that interferes with, you know, natural reality and the observer. The more it's a reality for you, the more it becomes a reality in reality. Yeah. Makes exactly. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it's interesting because at the end of the day, it's not so different from the dynamics that many things are striking us nowadays, like people who believe in horoscope or the concept of karma mm -hmm. that is popularly used nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is what you were mentioning before. We are here. Yes. Sneak peeking. Yeah, uh, they're um, spinning yarn into our uh, wool into yarn. Mm -hmm. So we've got these, uh, they've got this big pile of uh, wool, and then they've got these hand operated drop spindles uh, that will sort of in, uh, you, they'll twist it using their fingers and then it will coil up uh, around the drop spindle. Uh, and then when that's done, you pull all the yarn off and you can roll that into a skein and use that for whatever you need to use yarn for. And then you have Ursula, right? Ursula gets included because she is one of the people, well, someone needs to look after the kid. Um, but as sort of the next generation, she gets included in the practice long before she's able to actually do the practice. Exactly. And make it something natural for her life experience from, from her early, early years. Exactly. We saw the same thing with um, Anna uh, with the, in the Albans Bakery, um, where right she was helping, quote-unquote, um, need uh, the, one of the loaves of dough. And it was not very helpful helping, but, you know, she still is involved in that practice. Um, same thing with, like, Lenhard and Paul. You're going to see uh, Paul is involved in sort of the mill work. Uh, Berthold is already helping sort, um, keep track of the sorts and start setting the type. So he actually uses printer fonts as well, despite being a child. At the end of the day, and so you get the, you get this beautiful rendition of, yeah, right, like, children being involved in historical social practice. And it's great. And quite anthropologically logical, because that's the very notion of being born and raised practicing something. It becomes natural for, to you as much as uh, it's natural for us to watch TV, so to speak. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, this is a period without universal education. Mm -hmm. So skills have to get right. All education is, um, if you can afford it, you know, private tutoring for women or basic schooling uh, for men. Uh, there's no co-ed schools yet. But then from about like the age of 10 or 12 onwards, uh, if you weren't already involved in just vocational training, you're going to be doing just vocational training. And of course, here we are trying to not to make a big mess sitting. Exactly. And we get mini games to teach you the basics of a lot of stuff. Like uh, last stream, we had the uh, helping out with the horseshoes in a mini game. That's actually a mini game that got patched in after launch that wasn't originally there. Uh, but, you know, uh, taking this as like a historical priority of the game is like giving you these mini games to do practice uh, and expanding that to more professions. Yeah, 
of course. Mm -hmm. we are... Yep, you got a twist. And then you click on the other hand to actually wind it up on the whorl. There we go. And there we go. It's fascinating how sometimes a, a design is exactly what is needed and it survives centuries because this this design for spindles is found in, in archaeological sites from, uh, I think, actually, if I remember well, first and second century BC, uh, very useful. In, in most yeah. of the Roman Empire, you can find exactly this design with different decorations all along. Uh, absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, it continues into, uh, I've seen spindle worlds in the United States um, as late as the 19th century. Sure. So, like fundamentally, this is this is just how you if you don't have access to a spinning wheel, which is still a relatively young technology um, in Europe in the 16th century, less so by the 18th or 19th century. But you know, um, if you don't have access to it, how else do you turn wool into yarn, or theoretically the same with like flax fibers into linen thread? You got to do it by hand. <laughs> And of course, it's not a matter of you do your own, it's a communal activity with all the implications of that, of course. Oh, yeah. And all the gossip that that comes from. This is the closest thing to Google that you can get in, in the uh, 16th century. Exactly. Mm. Yes. Say that. Uh... Yeah, my beloved. I really <laughs> love the design of this character. He's so good. And the nature to stand out and be clearly distinguishable from the style of any other character is like another school of art. And this really is a very unique and so interesting. Yeah. That you see from, from other shirts, Christian shirts. Exactly. Um, it, is, it is really nice. And now that we've done this, um, we should be able to have right get everyone invited for lunch, which is very nice. And of course, a very interesting source of information. Exactly, uh, it is. It is one of the most breathtakingly beautiful scenes, uh, in like the entire game, uh, is that lunch sequence. So it's great. DC letters when someone is angry. Yep. I really love the image of Andreas trying to do something with the spindle and leaning on the window. It's like so unexpected. I know. Uh, and you can tell, right, he's not super um, confident doing it because he has to keep re dropping, resting the spindle on something while it's spinning, and he works this very slow way. Exactly. You, you can see the contrast between the veterans and him you know, in the very movement. Yeah. Even and we get him. Ursula just playing with it, the tiniest kitten. Look at it. I mean, if there is something that is realistic, it's this. If you have wool somewhere else and there is a cat, that's like madness. Oh, yeah. I, 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 since the first time I saw this scene, I think it's so intelligent that they are using the gossiping around a communal activity as a as a way to to manage and distribute the information in in the plot. It's and I, I never get tired of saying it. Kudos to the to the designers and writers of this game. It's incredible. Yeah. Hmm. I. <laughs> Quick fingers. I, I, it's something I've never seen another historical game do, and. Yeah, it's a thing I think we need more of. Um, Cause, yeah, like I don't know, it's such an integral part of historical things that, like, if you're just making like a reference wiki of like art history or other stuff, you're probably not getting super far. Oh, far. Uh, 
But right, um, if you're just like doing regular historical reference for like an Assassin's Creed or something, you maybe get some sense of this, and you see this represented like obliquely. Like you can see, oh, there's the loom, and there's an in-process thing on it. But you don't get this. Right, where you've got... Mm -mm. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's just that I, I was thinking that, I think it's what Alex once mentioned, that, that that's a very touristical approach that many times you get with these big uh, eclectic references, that you know it exists, you know the aesthetic, you know it was part of the place, but you don't really get this human interaction around it, and the implications of this object or this thing that you know exists, but no more. This, this is another level. Exactly. <laughs> And the idea that people flirt with each other, um, right, that, like, this is, quote-unquote, a woman's only space. And so people would come by to flirt by literally leaning in the window. And not prospecting, so to speak, yeah. Isn't she cute? Mm -hmm. He just and time has passed, right? Uh, they've been playing. They got bored, and now both the kitten and Ursula are taking a nap. Um. Okay. Yeah, Andreas is discovering the reality of, of community. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I love it. <laughs> this is also a good point because, like, many times it happens in museums or even literature or movies. Um, his, people in history, not historical people, people in history seem to be like static characters. They, it's sometimes it's hard to depict them as humans, living and sentient humans. Mm -hmm. But in this game, there is absolutely. No, not of the static or the statue. Everyone is a person, and and that is something that you perceive from from first conversation. I mean, not not to wade into the ongoing historical uh, history community drama TM, mm -hmm. but like, uh, right, um, Ridley Scott's portrayal of Napoleon has gotten criticized for exactly that of like boiling down a lot of complexity mm -hmm. into, um. So, S sad man with a troubled marriage conquers Europe instead of going to therapy. That's a summary. Have you watched it? I, I've not seen it yet, but I uh, several people who I trust to uh, have good thoughtful takes on it um, have come back and been like, mm, yeah, maybe not. Uh, and I think right part of that is the format, um, where you know the movie is what two and a half hours long. Right. If you say two to three hours for a movie's runtime, a biography is four or five hundred pages. So that's what fifteen hours to read, uh, ish. Roughly depends on how fast you read. Um, the game has twenty-five to thirty hours of, or well, if you play fast, fifteen hours. But for the most part, like twenty-five-ish hours with these characters. And so, right, you get, you have more time to have scenes that are just about historical nuance uh, and like trying to do interesting things with these characters and with these practices. You still have to be thoughtful and efficient, but right, you have more run to, runway to work with, and I think therefore greater opportunity to show these. Uh, practices in a way that a otherwise narratively similar like murder mystery historical TV show or movie wouldn't have the opportunity to. Fair enough. And I quite agree that many times the, the biography or the biopic especially um, feels some limitation in, especially in comparison with, with elaborated bibliography if you are familiar with it. Yet, I must say that 
sometimes you clearly see more or less talent in, in the display of, uh, of a biography in any other format that is obituary. So some biographies are really complex, so they are two hours long. And sometimes in this yeah. case, you can see the development of a character arc really, really well elaborated, even if it's not a lot of hours on, on site, so to speak. Yeah, uh, certainly, right? There, there, there's a lot of ways you can make all the things work. It's just, right, each one has slightly different constraints. Uh, and it's it's nice to see this one uh, leaning into the gamey aspects of it, right, of these very broken up sort of cutscenes, dialogue trees, whatever, and really leaning into that to write characters instead of um, I don't know, um, trying to stick closer to biography, right? Just sm smart decisions all around. Uh, where understands how much track it has to work with and really runs with that as far as it can in a way that a lot of media, I think, that tries to challenge the right character drama and action together um, perhaps struggles with. Right, because like, I've been playing a lot of Dragon Age recently, actually as a game that I think almost succeeds but kind of doesn't. Um, and there's a lot that's really, really well written in Dragon Age, uh, Dragon Age Origins. And that's really cool. Um, but at the same time, there's kind of a lot of game where you, the most things you get are your main party kind of snarking at each other while you're running around engaging with the combat mechanics. And the dialogue mechanics and the combat mechanics shall never meet each other. Like, they're fundamentally two halves of a system, uh, and the two halves stay pretty well siloed. Uh, so, it's a case where uh, a game that, like this one, that is all dialogue, right? All dialogue all the time. Uh, with little minigame snippets for historical practice, uh, is able to devote those resources and design time to fleshing out characters and making everyone feel unique and representative of something larger, but also relate to each other in ways that make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking it's even difficult to follow or to individualize characters many times, despite it has a ton of characters. So sometimes having a gang of five or six in your warrior little main character group um, makes it sometimes feel like over-creating the character, as I like to call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like the, the point that, as you were saying, men are leaning here, obviously, to flirt, but also like acknowledging that they are learning in a women's space. Yeah. Video games don't do that usually. This game is quite something. It's... This game is special, right? This this game is real special, and I got oh, it's very funny. Um, six months before this game released last year, I fully published an article in Games and Culture that was like, oh yeah, uh, I one of the points of my argument was like, really, I don't think it's possible to translate academic discourses into a game space. And therefore, it's important that groups like, you know, uh, my channel, like Sasa, exist as an intermediary that serve as uh, interpreters to sort of bring in academic discourses uh, and more academic media studies together in a way to sort of bring in the history fun facts, bring in the information in a way that games I don't think can. That was in June. And in November, Pentiment released, and it is wildly closer to that standard than anything else I have ever played, and it's not close. So much for timing. Right? I was like, come on. <laughs> hey. Um, we should go up to the Abbey, and I think we should work. I know we're running low on time for the stream, but we should go hang out with Sebat. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's quicker if we go to the Abbey through the town, like here. Uh, yeah, I think... Either option, uh, it's about the same. And yeah, I think that we should get to the Abbey and call it a day, or I will start stealing your time, and that's the last thing I want to do. 
Okay. I need to speak to it. No. Did you? The fact that sentiment was the in the time in your article made you feel like they were somehow listening to you and your and your prayers. Ha. No. Uh. Uh, certainly not. Uh, it's because I know this was in development for what almost three years. Um, it was in development for quite a while. Uh, but it was very funny that uh, I don't think it had been announced yet even when I uh wrote the article. But it was like uh, just a little bit of time later, and I was like, yeah, okay, now here we are. Um with a wildly successful game and I had a great time with it, right? The thing is, I'm delighted to be wrong. Um, is could not be happier about the fact that I'm wrong because it gives us great games, right? I mean, ultimately, that's a lot of what my advocacy stuff is about, is just I want more good, good historical games that do interesting things with the time period they represent and lean less into, you know, stereotype and combat and big action stuff I'm more into how do we tell interesting stories that believe in the world they are adapting on its own terms and uh, so I mean right this game um, in some ways Stray Gods uh, I think is uh, interested in sort of this genre of like epic uh of or of poetic epic and uh, how do we adapt that into a modern setting what what formats do that what while well, preserving these characters um blasphemous is a fantastic example of like you know spanish catholicism is just a little bit messed up and what do we do about that uh right how do we portray that in a game and for blasphemous uh so you would get we're getting a lot more of these games, and even like Assassin's Creed, right? Mirage is way more interested in uh, sort of caliphal period um, Islamic art history than like any other Assassin's Creed game is interested in its historical period. Or the times they are. Anyway, uh, I, Sorry. I wasn't paying attention to the dialogue. Are we not having lunch with Sebat? Uh, yeah, uh, I was uh, I, it was just. I was speaking with him and I was watching the clock and I thought that maybe I gave him the, the answer of maybe later because I was wondering if this is a good moment to, to stop it because it's uh, half past ten and of course things are going to start unfolding in, in no time as you probably know better than me. So uh, do you think sure. this could be a good moment to leave it for today? I think either side of the lunch is fine. If you want to leave it here, that's fine. If you want to uh, sort of wrap up with Sebat's lunch, I'm cool with that too. It's, it's just that, uh, if I remember well, of course, uh, the lunch is going to in, uh, inevitably lead us to another place, and that is something that will be very cruel to, to make people wait for two weeks. So I, I think that it's fair to, to leave this just ready to start for next streaming. Sounds good. Perfect. And I said two weeks, uh, especially because next week uh, we are not going to be uh, moving around the Abbey, Abbey because next week uh, we are going to be enjoying something really special. Um, Alex is going to, to bring a very special host and we are going to talk about Assassin's Creed VR. We are going to try not to get uh, busy with the new perspective of video games. So Benjamin will be back in two weeks. So as usual, thank you so much everyone here in the chat. Of course, thank you Adam. I mean, it was a privilege and a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I mean, as I said last week, I'll say it again. This is probably my favorite game of all time. Uh, so I'm always happy to come in and ramble about it. And we are so welcome to have you. So until the next time, have a good evening, afternoon, or day, everyone. Goodbye. Yep. Bye-bye.